So our next uh, part of this agenda is on the movement that we've been trying to build as a radical exchange organization. And to date, uh, we've been able to bring together about 100 chapters interested in these ideas. We've got a team of 50 plus volunteers and, and it's growing every day. But we do have questions. How do you continue to promote the education of these ideas? How do you continue to build a community? And how do you balance planning and the uh, marshalling of resources uh, with ultimately letting a million flowers bloom, which is our intent? And so our next panel is about some of these questions. So the next person here you should be familiar with, he's the founder and chairman of Radical Exchange. He is aptly uh, refers to himself as a political econ economist and social technologist. He's principal researcher at Microsoft Research and lecturer at Princeton University. And he's seen some accolades of recent. Bloomberg Top 50, he was one of Wired Magazine's 25 leaders shaping the next 25 years of technology. And he was one of Coindesk's most influential people in blockchain for 2018. Uh, but beyond that, uh, and he wouldn't do this himself, but I certainly will. He's the reason for what we have here, this great event. So I'd like you to give a really warm welcome to our founder, chairman, uh, Glenn Well. And I'm gonna welcome up our uh, uh, wonderful panel. Um, you guys wanna come up on stage and I'll introduce you from here. So, um, in, in making these introductions of this incredible trio that we have, uh, I wanted to do something a little unconventional in the spirit of some of the ideas that, we've, that have been so important to us in this movement. And I think, especially since the book, and m much of the ideas of this community have come since the book. The book was an inspiration, but it was the start of a conversation, as Jeff said. Um, one of the most important ideas has been to think about social identity and how social identity relates to um, the sorts of institutions that we're proposing and how it justifies them. And in particular, the fact that social identity is fundamentally social, not individual, that we can't think of ourselves as islands or as completely self-sovereign, but at the same time, that there is not a single collective that we belong to. Instead, we are all members of a wide range of communities. And this is an idea that uh, is often called intersection. Um, it's used in a variety of ways, but it, it dates to my knowledge back to actually a sociologist in the late 19th century named Georg Zimmel. And in fact, we named one of the rooms intersection after this. So the way I would like to introduce folks is to describe them as the intersection that they are. Um, and in particular, describe some of the in communities that are so important to the work we're doing here that they um, participate in and have contributed to and in a certain sense represent here. So um, first, uh, uh, on your left is uh, Nathan Schneider. So Nathan Schneider is a perfect example of the sort of unique intersection that we are looking for here. He is deeply connected to and uh, uh, entangled with uh, uh, Catholicism and Catholic social thought, and at the same time with the platform cooperativism movement, and with uh, social uh, media studies in, within the academy, with the Occupy Wall Street movement, and with journalism. Now that's not a combination you'd expect to see just about anywhere else, and I think that's true of all of our guests. So, uh, the second is uh, Marsha um, Shatlin. Um, Marsha is in um, a bunch of different academic areas, including African American studies and history, but she's also deeply involved in social movements, in particular, both in their study academically, but also in the reality of the movement for black lives. Um, and as such, she's a public uh, intellectual and a theorist of social movements. And finally, um, Tawana uh, Honeycomb Petty, uh, just to my right, is um, a, a perfect representative of the community where we find ourselves, Detroit. Um, but she's also deeply tied to the arts and social justice movements, the technology and social justice movements, uh, activism within the African American community, and poetry. And before we um, turn to questions, and I'll try to get through my questions as quickly as possible so that we can get some from the audience, um, 
I, I would love for each of you to just say a little bit about what brings you to this conversation and um, your experience in uh, social organizing. Well, uh, welcome to Detroit, or as we say, what up, though? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so again, I'm Tawana. I'm also known as Honeycomb. I'm a poet. That's my performance name. And uh, I am a mother, first and foremost, which I think brought me into the social justice movement, raising a black son in the city of Detroit. Um, I am a... Um, Data Justice Coordinator for Detroit Community Technology Project, Director of Data Justice. And you are sitting in a city that uh, essentially 38% uh, of the city doesn't have access to broadband. So while we're sitting in like this very technologically innovative, beautiful space, um, the reality is a lot of community members within the neighborhoods don't have access. And so um, I am committed to this, this movement, Radical, exchange because I'm ready for the world that I think we all deserve. And so I was really excited to see that you all were interested in Detroit and um, very honored to be invited to be included on this panel because I think that there are a lot of conversations that we need to have that we don't always have an opportunity to have. And so that's why I'm here. Thank you, Tom. Hi, folks. Um, I am first and foremost um, a person who's who came into academia perhaps through an unusual route, and it was because I was a student organizer uh, when I was a student at the University of Missouri in Columbia. I was part of a incoming class of more than 5,000 students, and maybe 200 of us were African American. I was on a campus that was very much grappling with questions of what does it mean to serve a state, um, that had two major metropolitan areas that were filled with African Americans who couldn't access the flagship university in the state. And as I organized around issues of hate crimes, um, LGBTQ issues on campus, what I discovered the most enjoyable part of organizing was the teaching part. We would go into a room full of people who had felt powerless or confused about an issue of concern and we could explain to them why they actually had more power than they could imagine. Mm -hmm. And that was the route that um, got me into teaching the history of civil rights as well as the history of black capitalism. And I think that if there is a thread that connects the various work I do in the classroom and in the public sphere of talking about the radical possibility of history in order to animate our ideas about the future, it's because I have a sense that our best ideas we never tried. We never really tried school integration. We never really tried open housing. We never really tried access to the ballot. And so I think that what I have found with my students, whether it's the ones I teach in a formal setting or the folks that I meet out in the road, is that the deep ignorance about this nation's history for good or for bad has led people to believe they have fewer options and fewer choices about the ways that they can live their lives yeah. and they can project an idea of the future. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful to, to be here and to be part of this conversation, which brings together worlds I'm, I'm not used to be. Uh, seeing in one room. Um, I don't know if you remember, Tawana, but once you gave me a ride uh, <laughs> after, uh, after a, a meeting here some years ago about um, uh, the future of work, uh, 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 kind of built out of the legacy of Grace Lee Boggs and the Boggs Center and it's uh, uh, that community of, of work in Detroit building alternatives on the ground here. Um, and then to see people I've known from blockchain circles uh, uh, around the world here, to, uh, uh, I've just been so grateful to pour through, work through uh, Glenn's book. Um, I, I come here in particular in recent years uh, working with another legacy of rethinking economic systems, building alternatives in the midst of the world that we live in, the cooperative tradition, uh, a tradition that has shaped our economy and the world around us in ways that we don't often appreciate. Uh, 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 a cross-racial tradition in this country, a tradition that crosses political lines, that does a lot of the stuff that uh, people are, uh, are talking about, are craving uh, uh, today. So 
uh, I'm really grateful uh, that this gathering is happening and to be a part of it. So th thank you all so much. I think you're the perfect group to have this conversation with. Um, so the things that um, I want to focus on, uh, J Jeff uh, highlighted some of the strengths, some of the exciting things. Uh, everyone in this room is a testament to those. But the truth is, um, we didn't expect any of this. Um, uh, middle of last summer, I just started thinking there was so much activity, I should try to help people communicate with each other in some way. And now we have 100, 120 groups around the world, many represented here, working on this. Um, there are so many ways in which it falls short of our dreams, and yet also so many ways in which it surprises us relative to what we possibly could have deserved to hope it would be. And I want to focus on those ways in which it falls short, um, because I think that is our greatest opportunity for growth. Um, so I want to just share with you some of the things I've been struggling with the most, and I really want to get your reaction as to how to deal with them. So I think one of the biggest struggles for me has been how and to what extent and over what time frame to democratize internally and to bring in the feedback, whether it's through the sort of mechanisms that I've been proposing, like quadratic voting and whatever, or you know, other democratic tools, to open things up to this community that is here in this room versus the fears that we don't have people from the global south much in this room. We do not have people much in this room from rural areas. We do, so there, there are many, many dimensions of inclusion that we are not hitting. And if we follow the preferences just of the representative things in this room, I am scared, though not, my hope is that we've chosen, you know, we've gotten the right people involved, but I'm scared that we choose to make things too convenient, that we choose to make two things too natural for this group of people, which is diverse in wonderful ways and not fully. How do you think about balancing those those things. I guess I'll start. So I guess if we really distill it down to its most basic idea of you know who's here and who's not here, I guess my question is what is the common language of vocabulary of the future that's being deployed that is actually possible to bring people closer? And the reason why I say that is because one of the things that I think we are stuck in at this moment is we're in the age of really good intentions and a deep fragility about feedback. So people have really good intentions. And I think people are really, really kind. And they're unable to tolerate the neg negative emotions of others that we may bring into a space. And so I, I guess the real question is, what are you offering that seems like a viable solution to ask people to reject or leave behind something else. And I think that this is where people get really stuck on social movements. They think that the idea of a more democratized world is enough of a ask. But how is that going to happen? And if I lose my ability to connect with community, if I lose my job, if I lose my sense of safety, what is this community going to provide? I think about it, you know, I try to, I try to do anti-racist work. Sometimes it doesn't work, but I try. <laughs> And I think that the central question for most white Americans is, what do I get in exchange of the many gifts of white supremacy? Yeah. Like, what, do, what can an anti-racist community offer? And if it's moving closer to human dignity, how is that animated in the world in ways that are so legible that a person will make that choice? And so I guess the question for this community is, what is being offered in the places in which people are most kept away from even the possibility of options? Mm -hmm. And when they land there, what are they going to get? Mm. And I, I think it's important too to think about diversity not as check marks, but also in terms of power. Right, um, you know, I, th I think of, for instance, the, uh, the populist movement of the late 19th century, which um, brought about, first envisioned some of the important features that would later become part of what social safety net we have in this society, the kind of social contract of the 20th century. Uh, uh, and it was often a coalition of people who didn't 
get along in other contexts, yeah. right? You know, black farmers, white farmers, and the Farmers Alliance, uh, and uh, uh, the, the immigrant workers in the cities in the um, Knights of Labor, right? Uh, these were people who didn't have, you know, they had some conflicting uh, interests, but they realized that they had more important things in common and built a political block around that, you know, recognizing really what they have in common. And, and another feature of that movement, you know, in, in reading some of their documents that really moved me, you know, when we hear populism today, we tend to think of, you know, certain, certain faces. The leaders of that movement were so anxious about the problem of demagoguery. And they insisted on building movements that served people's needs day to day. You know, the, the, the Knights of Labor, unlike labor unions today, in many, many cases, decreasingly, uh, uh, this is starting to change, but, but um, they were helping workers build their own businesses, build cooperatives, build, uh, 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 control their own labor. Uh, in, um, in the rural context, the Farmers Alliance was enabling farmers to build their own economies to combat the uh, concentrations of economic power in the cities. Um, so they were, they, their tool against demagoguery was it helping people build their own power in their own lives, solving their own problems. And, you know, I, I think that lesson is important for thinking about what we mean by democratizing. Are we just drawing people in because we want to have a certain, you know, set of percentages and ratios? Or are we truly coming together because we recognize we have a shared need that's urgent and that we can solve if we come together. Um, I think that's, that's, that's very helpful, though I, I would love any concrete advice you have about when should we move to like having elections? When should, I mean, th these, are, these are pressing lessons for us, so if offline you have any thoughts about those types of things, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, but uh, let's turn to that question that you just uh, raised, Nathan. I think it's a very good one. Um, so one model of democratization is to build up independent power sources within this whole thing, like these local groups or other cross-cutting things, and to try to do everything we can to enable them, rather than any sort of center, to be the main point at which the vitality lives. Do you think that that is a powerful way to potentially try to cut across some of these class line issues or to reach out to areas that are just structurally going to find it really hard to fly all the way to Detroit um, for this sort of thing? H how do you think about that? Or any, anyone else? Yeah. Tawana, do you have thoughts about that? Yeah. So, I, I, you know what? I think in any movement that's thinking about democratizing, um, I have to always come from the root of sitting in Detroit. Um, yeah. Well, more specifically on Anishinaabe uh, land, indigenous mm. territory here um, that we now call Detroit. Um, <laughs> but uh, the forced, uh, predominantly black city of um, over 700,000 black people. And so um, I, I come from that perspective. Mm. Um, and as a black woman, I have to think about in this room, um, how we think of diversity, uh, number one, is that everything other than white? Um, is that how we're looking at diversity? And also, what is our struggle towards uh, dismantling the global phenomenon of anti-black racism? And so I'm thinking of this radical um, exchange movement and how brilliant it is, but also thinking about the language as you talked about, like we still think of anyone other than white as a minority. Um, we still think of, there's a lot of language that drives um, how we move. We still think of um, even the poorest white man uh, as superior um, over pretty much every other living being in the universe. And so I think that if we're talking about um, a radical exchange movement, if we're talking about democratizing, we have to start with the language. We have to start with the things that we've internalized. And so we can't even begin to apply it to a movement until we've done that internal work. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I think that just at the very core, um, that has to be at the forefront of any movement that we're trying to sustain. And it's absolutely essential to acknowledge too, just to uh, go back into that history, 
you know, to, lest we think it is utopian, you know, those gains that that movement, that often very multicultural movement envisioned were won finally for some at the cost of others, mm -hmm. you know, in the New Deal with the Southern Democrats and uh, uh, that, that enabled a lot of that social safety net to form uh, without uh, many, many black Americans, without uh, people who were working in some of the most vulnerable sectors of the economy. So, so the, the, the uh, importance of ensuring that we build movements that are uh, 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 resistant to that, kind of, to that kind of vicious compromise, we have to recognize that that is so deeply in our history. Marcia, you want to add something? Yeah. I just want to uh, draw something into this conversation. I was part of the working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation at Georgetown, in which the university really wanted to think about how its dependence on the system of slavery um, allowed for its sustenance and its growth for, you know, century, for a century after. And one of the things that I think is so important is that it allowed me to think, rethink the assumption that the university is always good, right? There's these yeah. certain institutions that we always place in either a neutral position or we imagine is always good. And so when we start to kind of fetishize the democratic process, right? We fetishize the collective, we fetishize all of these things. They are built on such beautiful principles, but their application can start to normalize inequality and then we kind of breathe the air and then it, it seems natural to us that some people belong at universities and others do not. Mm -hmm. That some people get paid certain amounts of money and others do not. That some pieces of land should belong to a university and not to people. And so one of the things that I think if this as a collective wants to really imagine is the places in which we normalize inequality so deeply mm -hmm. because we have such a strong yearning for change that the disequilibrium that we feel is usually because of that. Yeah. That our idealism is being interrupted by the fact that we've normalized these systems of inequality in places that should be good, but sometimes are not. Do we have time for one question from the audience or should we call it? Well, let's, take, let's take one question from the audience. Someone come up to the microphone if they want to ask a question. Anyone? We have one, one question. Hi, uh, Joseph Potman with X Algorithms Foundation. I just want to thank you for mentioning the Anish Anishinaabeg uh, territory land. It might be a term that a lot of people aren't familiar with. I'd like just perhaps if you could identify which people they are. And also I'd like to challenge you, uh, and perhaps with Glenn <laughs> or the others, to perhaps draw a line between uh, First Nations relationship with land and Henry George's concepts. Yeah. Actually, it sounds like you have the answer to the question that you're asking me, so <laughs> I'd offer up your, uh, because honestly, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not indigenous, right? That's why I don't say I'm a native Detroiter, which a lot of people use language to say that they're native to a particular land, and I, I don't use that language, and I know that it's the three fires, um, Potawatomi, and I'm going to screw up the other two. But if you have that knowledge to offer into the room, I, I definitely invite you to do so. Before I do, perhaps, uh, Glenn, have you thought about the connection between First Nations concepts of the relationship so, of people so, and So let, let, let me first say that um, First Nations is one of about 100 incredibly rich cultural and intellectual traditions mm -hmm. that I see connections to and I know almost nothing about to make those connections. Another early Islam has some ideas that I think are deeply resonant with uh, radical exchange type ideas. Moism in the Chinese tradition uh, is another one. But yes, First Nations relationship to land I think is, uh, has a powerful connection to Henry George on both ends. Because actually the notion of common ownership of the earth was commonly used in a very one-sided way by European colonists to expropriate the land. And at the same time, they then immediately turned around and turned it into private property. Right. And in the process, completely undermined their justification. But had they continued with that, they might have actually had something much closer to native people's um, vision. So I think there's a lot to be said there. I have very little of it to say. Um, but I really hope we can draw, that's another group that we can draw into the movement to speak that truth. So 
Thank yeah, you. So in the interest of time, I will not add to that, but yeah. I'll be happy to discuss that, those lines of connection. That would be, if anyone there. knows about that, that would be great on a conference session. So thank you. And thank to all of you. This was a wonderful conversation.